us bow our heads now for prayer. Our Lord God, great creator of heavens and earth, who brought again Jesus from the dead and alive with us for these 2,000 years, ever living to confirm his word and make it true each generation. We are so thankful for his divine presence just now, knowing this, that we have this great assurance that after this life is over, we have life eternal in the world that is to come. Thank you for this, Lord. And that hope, an anchor to the soul that's steadfast and sure in time of storm. And when the storms come, the great waves are rolling. We feel that by faith in Him, we can caress every wave. God, help us tonight as we come to minister to the sick and the needy. We pray, God, that there will not be a sick person among us when we leave tonight. May every person be healed by Thy divine power, both here and across the nation of the hookup. May there not be a feeble person go out of any building or any gathering tonight. May your spirit heal them. Let the great Son of Righteous with healing in his wings rise. Send forth the rays of faith in every heart as they listen to the Word. See the manifestations of the Holy Spirit convincing them that he is still alive. We pray these blessings, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. We certainly deem this a grand privilege to be here tonight again to, to speak to the people and pray for the sick. We want to greet all those who are out in the land of the, the telephone connections across the nation again tonight. And so we pray that God will bless each one of you, trusting that all that accepted Christ this morning will be filled with the Holy Ghost and ever live faithful and true to Him until life is over here on earth, this mortal life. And then they, by doing that, they have eternal life. They will never die in the age that is to come, to the great age that we all look forward to. Now, uh, we're going to uh, say while I'm thinking of it, not to interrupt. Brother Vale is here, and I might not get to see him. Uh, can I send that manuscript on to you when I get back to Tucson? I'm looking it over. I haven't got it all read yet. And I'll send it back to you as soon as you get to Tucson. Now, I am wanting to make an announcement. This is especially to the churches everywhere, especially in the West or anywhere that wants to come. Our noble brother, Brother Perry Green, with uh, it's a man that's instigator of this Hook up of this telephone here. The Lord has been putting it up on his heart to come visit us at Tucson and start a revival at Tucson, which we really need. And Brother Perry will be in Tucson. If you want to contact him, just get a hold of our office there. It'll be August the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th. He's had it up on his heart for a long time. And I told him he's on the way to get it off your heart. Go do it. And he's a Christian brother a real servant of God, and you people in Tucson, I know, will be blessed as he ministers there somewhere, perhaps at the Ramada Inn, or wherever the Lord provides a place. He hasn't got it on here, but I know you'll be blessed by coming here in Brother Green as he expounds to us the Word of God, perhaps praying for the sick or whatever it lays in the duty of God's anointing to do. We also want to thank Brother Armand Neville, Brother Man, for this wonderful time of fellowship with them. How I'm very grateful to have be associated with such man as Brother Neville, Brother Man, and all these other ministers around here, I suppose, have been recognized. If you haven't, by our board and our church here, I'm sure that God recognizes you here as his servants. May the Lord ever bless you. Now I was asked a little something here on a little note was given me to uh, they had a trustee meeting the other night here on the board of trustees and deacons. And I think the minutes were read this morning before the church, which that's custom for us to do that in the decisions that was made by the board of trustees 
and deacons here in the church. Of course, it can't please everyone. We cannot do that. I have not one thing to do with the trustee board or the deacon board. I have not even a vote unless there's a tie and I have to be here to do it then. Brother Armand Neville takes that second vote. Then we have to sign these because we're part of the church. But what the trustee board and them board's decision they make, we certainly stand behind them 100% because that's what they're here for. And their decisions is between them and God. I cannot, cannot, and would not by any means contrary to that decision. And another thing, I am forbidden by the United States government to make any decision concerning that. So please don't ask me to correct their decisions. I cannot do it and I will not hear nothing about it. See, So don't ask me to correct their decisions. You see the board. That's the one that made the decisions. All right. Now, in the event of a coming meeting, it is possible, if the Lord willing, I'll be coming back here uh, in about four to six weeks or something like that for maybe another Sunday's meeting. And I announced this morning I wanted to speak on God manifested in His Word. And I just won't have time tonight. And frankly, I haven't hardly got enough voice to do it. And then the crowd, there's almost as many on the outside as there is on the inside, and perhaps more, counting those buses and trucks and things that's sitting out there with the people. Turned on. The little broadcast has stepped up a little. We can hear it. This little wave, short wave from the tabernacle, we can pick that up a city block away. And some of the cars are several city blocks away, the lines of car, up and down and around and through the streets around the tabernacle tonight. I don't believe at any time, visibly, we've ever had more people jammed in and around the church than we have tonight. So we are, and many, many, many are just driving up and driving away. So it goes to show where the carcass is, the eagles will gather. And may I say to you tonight, in this little group of people, it's an international gathering. Practically over two-thirds of the states of the Union is represented here besides five foreign nations, even to Russia, and all over the different parts of the country, way down into uh, Venezuela, out into Jamaica, all over the different parts of the nation, people are here hungering and thirsting for God. What a marvelous time. Now, I want, before uh, reading the Bible, and will you pray for me now, I, I'm going to try to bring a little message, the Lord willing, on the appropriation of divine healing. For this morning, <clears throat> we talked on salvation, and tonight we're going to speak a few minutes on divine healing and then call the prayer line and pray for the people. <clears throat> While we're doing this, out on the hookups, wherever you are, even out in the buses and cars around within a block or two of the tabernacle, when it comes time to pray for the sick, if you can't get into the building, which you cannot, I'm sure now, because doorways everywhere is jammed tight, past, and no room, nowhere. So you pray and lay your hands on one another out there and let each minister who's hooked in tonight uh, also pray for his congregation while the healing services are going on. We believe that God is ominent present everywhere. Now, before we read, <clears throat> or before we, we pray, we want to read some of God's Word. <clears throat> and I changed my my scriptures a while ago because wanting to change the type of meeting that I had set in my mind for tonight. So I have changed it a little bit. And so I had to change my scriptures, not change them, but set them in another order of divine healing so that uh, people would understand. Let's turn to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. And we will begin at the 12th verse of the 24th chapter and read down to about 34. It's on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter 
arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher and stooping down, and he beheld the linen clothes, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which is from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. Now, it takes ten furlongs to make a, uh, to make a mile, so it's about six miles. And as they talked together of these things which had happened, it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them whose name was Cleopius answered, saying unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And has not thou known these things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? Now remember, this is Jesus himself, risen, talking. And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and a word before God and all the people, how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to, the, to, be, to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that he had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Listen now, Jesus. Then said he unto them, O fools, Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass. As he sat at meat with them, he took bread, and blessed it, and break it, and give it to them, and their eyes were opened. And they knew him, and he vanished out of their sights. And they said one to the other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the Scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together. And when they were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared unto Simon, and they told what things were done in the way and how that he was known to them by breaking of bread. Now let us pray. Dear gracious Father, we thank thee for thy word, for thy word is truth. Thy word is life. And thou, O Lord, and thy word are one. So we pray tonight, Lord, that you will come among us in the power of your resurrection and will show forth to us tonight, like those that came from Emmaus, that we too would return to our homes saying, Did not our hearts burn within us? Grant it, Lord, it's towards evening time again. 
For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to speak concerning this Bible and my subject tonight or the topic is events made clear by prophecy. Events made clear by prophecy. Now, the Bible is a different book from all other sacred books. The Bible is a different book. It is a book of prophecy foretelling future events. And it's also the revelation of Jesus Christ. All the way from Genesis to Revelation brings Him out in His fullness what He was and is. And the whole complete book, Revelations 1, 1 to 3, said the book is a book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the Word of God. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Now, all other books, sacred books, is only a code of ethics, a code of morals, or a code of theology. Something that, how many ever read, read the Koran, the Mohammedan Bible? And, um, and uh, the book of, on Buddhists and so forth. It's just a code of ethics. What people should live, how they should live. But it doesn't prophesy, doesn't say anything about uh, these things or about any special gifts being given to anybody. Anything to take place. Just like joining a lodge or something. Therefore, when churches come to the place that they make their church just a lodge to join, then they're plumb off the Word of God. Amen. For the Bible is a living, foretold witness of Jesus Christ. And as the earth has grown into its fullness, and also vines grow into their fullness, the day grows into its fullness, the Bible was manifested in its fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. He was the Word of God revealed. The whole complete book of redemption. The Bible is God's Word. Foretelling the future events. Its believers is commanded by its author to read and believe every word of it. Not just part of it. One word to disbelieve it, you might as well quit trying until you believe that word. Every word is absolutely a part of Almighty God. God made manifest, wound into His Word to show forth who He is. We are commanded as believers to believe every word of it. And it's wrote by the author of God Himself. There's nobody can add anything to it or take anything from it. If you would, it would be a freak body of God. It would have maybe like six fingers on one hand or, or three arms or something to add something, to take something away from it, be one arm short, one finger short. It's a complete body of Jesus Christ and in Christ being the male, the groom, the bride is represented in him also. And these two are one. At that day, you'll know that I am in the Father, the Father in me, I and you and you in me. What a complete picture. And the true believers in this word who accept it that way, believe it and with patience wait for its prophesied promises, every one of them to be manifested in its age. Every believer has watched for it. Every believer that's been on the toes watching is the one that's been revealed to. Now look in the days of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Why didn't those people recognize John? When the Bible plainly said by Isaiah, there will be a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Their last prophet they had, which is Malachi 3, said, Behold, I send my messenger before my face to prepare the way. Why didn't they see it? Because they was looking upon something that had been done, 
basing their thoughts upon some message that it went forth beforehand and failed to see the present manifestation of God in the day they were living. And Christians, everywhere, that's exactly where the world stands tonight. Without contradiction, that's the truth. Christians everywhere are trying to look back to some code of ethics that Mr. Luther wrote or Mr. Wesley, Sankey, Finney, Knox, Calvin, which none of us can speak evil of, but that was in a day past. The Pharisees looked back to see what Moses said. And they said, we have Moses. We don't know whence thou comest. But remember when Moses here, they didn't know whence he cometh. And now, they no wonder Jesus said to them, you garnish the tombs of the prophets and you are the one that put them in there. After their message is gone, a message goes through, the people see it, they make fun of it, the world does. And then after the messenger is finished and the message is done, then they build a denomination upon the message and there they die, right there. Never come to life again. Look just a moment to some of you people. And especially I speak to you Catholic people. Do you realize, have you ever read the actual history, the history of the Roman Catholic Church? How that on your martyrology, since St. Augustine of Hippo, how many million innocent people that the church put to death? I forget can't call the exact number, but it's up in the millions. St. Saint Hippo of uh, Saint Augustine of, Hip, of Hippo, Africa, made it a declaration that it was absolutely the will of God to put anybody to death that protests the Roman Catholic Church. Do you realize that in that that Saint Patrick was never recognized? till after his death as a Roman Catholic. He protested the Pope and all of his doings. And the uh, Catholic Church itself killed tens of thousands of his children. Did you know that the Catholic Church burnt Joan of Arc, that little sainted woman, to the stake for being, said she was a witch? Two hundred years later, dug up the bodies of the priests when they found out it was wrong and cast them into the sea without burying them in the sacred ground to do penance? Don't let the day pass over your head and be foolish. How then priests would like tonight to come forth that condemn Jesus? The only thing, they never seen the prediction of that hour. If they, Jesus said, search the Scriptures, for in them you think or other claim that you have eternal life, and the Scriptures is what tell you who I am. For that hour. Notice, the Bible cannot fail. It's one thing it cannot do. The Word of God fail. For it foretells its author's acts before he does it. Now, there's one chance out of a thousand that a man might make a prediction uh, that something other is going to happen and it would happen. But then if he places a, where it's going to happen... That cuts him down to maybe um, one chance out of 10,000. If he says the day it's going to happen, that cuts it down one chance out of about a million. And who it's going to happen to, that brings it down to billions of chances. But this Bible tells you exactly who, when, where, and what to look for and never has failed one time. Therefore, in a little discussion not long ago with a priest of the Sacred Heart Church up here. He said, Mr. Branham, you're trying to argue a Bible. So that's the history of the church. I said, it's not a history. It's God Himself in print. He said, God is in His church. I said, God is in the Word and anything contrary to it, let it be a lie. Or He said, let my Word be true and every man's Word a lie. He said, we're not to argue. I said, I never asked you to argue. But the Bible does say, come, let us reason together. 
It foretells the author's doings before he does it. Therefore, telling that, then that puts every man and woman at the judgment bar without any excuse. If you take what the Methodists say about it, what the Baptists say about it, what the Catholic says, what the Pentecostal says, or any other church, you might find some disappointments at the judgment. But if you'll just watch what the Bible says is going to happen and when it happens, then you'll recognize what happens. Now, it isn't right out in plain view that all people can see it. For Jesus, thank God, for hiding it from the eyes of the wise and prudent and would reveal it to babes such as would learn. Think of Almighty God setting in His own Word with power to blind the rich and imputed and, and educated scholars, blind their eyes so they can't see Him and open the eyes of the poor and illiterate. Notice these people from Emmaus. He said their, their understanding of him was with help. They talked to him and didn't even know who it was all day long. God can do that. For he's God. That's exactly what he done to those priests. Those scribes. Because it was written that he had to do that. God blinded their eyes so we'd have a chance. Notice they couldn't see. No matter how much scholars, how much priests they was, what they'd done, they still could not see it because they were blind. Their sight might have been twenty twenty physically, but their spiritual sight. The same thing I was trying to say this morning about the adultery of women dressing the way they do now. They are adulterers. In God's book, they are guilty of adultery every time they put on sexy-looking clothes. Their soul not knowing it. I believe them women, many of them, thousands of them are innocent and would by no means commit adultery. And the poor women with somebody who will let them get by with it without exposing it and tell the truth, commit adultery, which the Bible said, the whore that set up on many waters, that all the kings of the earth and the peoples of the earth, the churches and so forth, committed spiritual fornications with her. And she was a mother of harlots, denominations. We watch the Bible. For God doesn't leave us in darkness. He sent the Bible to foretell us the events before they happened in the very nature and time they would come. Now, it's something like uh, uh, looking on a calendar to see what date it is. If you think, say, if this is this Saturday, Sunday, what is it? Look on the calendar. The calendar will tell you what day it is when you see the actions of the people maybe going to church, you see the, the, hear the bells ringing, you wonder what day it is. Look on the calendar. It'll tell you what day it is. And when you see the church getting whirly, like it was the days of Sodom, see the church world all going into the worship the God of this evil age, and seeing that, then seeing a little minority group gathered out under the inspiration of God, producing again the life of Jesus Christ by the Scriptures that's supposed to happen, you know what hour you're living in. Amen. This Bible foretells by prophecy what day that we're living and what time we're living and what kind of events ought to be taking place. It foretells it exactly to the letter and has never missed one age. Amen. Amen. All the time. Not one time has it ever missed. And it won't. For who are predestinated to see it will see it. Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that the Father has given me will come. It's a word joining with the word. It can't do nothing else. We know it the day that we're living in. But as it has been in every age... People let man put their own interpretation to this word and causes them to be blinded to the event that's happened. Same thing it done with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Even when Paul stood there and tried to quote the Scripture, and one man smote him in the face because 
he called the high priest a whited wall. And then they missed seeing God confirm his prophesied word. See, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. The Bible is God. There's no contradiction in God. He's perfect. But the people with their own interpretation. Now notice, let me show you, friends. The churches cannot agree themselves on the interpretation of it. The Methodists can't agree with the Baptists. The Baptists, the Presbyterian, the Presbyterian, the Pentecostals, and with about 40 different organizations of Pentecost, they can't agree with one another. So you see, that would be babbling again. Confusing. But God does His own interpreting of His Word. He promises things thing and then does it Himself. He gives Himself the interpretation of it because He makes Himself known in that hour how far the, the body of Christ is advanced. From the feet to the head. Notice. Then that's the reason that these people fail to get it because they listen to what somebody else says about it instead of reading the Word like Jesus told them to do. And they are they that testify of me. Search the Scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. In other words, listen. What? Read the Scriptures and see what the Messiah was supposed to do. See what time the Messiah was supposed to come. Look who was going to forerun the Messiah. Look at the hour. There's to be a voice of one crying in the wilderness. John. And you have done telling you exactly what you listed. Look what I was supposed to do when I come. And now what have you done? Have I failed to meet this? See? Jesus speaking. Have I failed to meet this? Notice as we come on down through the Scriptures this afternoon, how that everything that was prophesied of Him happened just exactly where it's supposed to. They should have known this event, this fanatic, young fellow raised up about 33 years old, and, or 30 years old, and went down there and claimed all kinds of lights and doves ascending, and why, was this a, a disgrace? They said he was born with illegitimate parents, claimed he was born of a virgin birth, Ought they not to know that Isaiah said in Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born? Ought not they to know also that the prophet Isaiah said, A virgin shall conceive? They ought to know these things. But you see, the thing of it was, they were applying it somewhere way ahead. And this man to them didn't meet the specification. But he asked them, Search the Scriptures. For you think in them that you have eternal life, and they are the very thing that's testifying to my message. Amen. Not what some theologian said, but what God His own Word said would take place. Amen. Amen. So is it now. Amen. Search the Scriptures. For they are the one that tells us the hour we're living in. Tells us exactly what will take place in this day. They're the ones that you should rely upon. For they are the one that testifies of the person of Jesus Christ. For the Bible said that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever because He's a revelation of the Word in the age. Can't be no different. Therefore, by listening to man's interpretation, they see the confirmation of God's Word fulfilled. They fail to see it. Because it's going on all the time, but because they listen. And Jesus said, they're blind leaders. And if the blind leads the blind, what happens to them? Now remember, the Bible predicted this ecclesiastical age of this Lady of Sin age was blind. They had him outside the church. There's not another age. Another church age that Jesus is on the outside, but the Lady of Sia church age, He was on the outside trying to get back in. I stand at the door and knock. You're supposed to be inside. But He said, because you say I'm rich, increased in goods, have need of nothing, and don't know, don't know that you're blind. 
feeding the blind. Poor in spirit. Wretched. Miserable. Naked. And don't know it. What a... If a man was naked on the street, miserable, blind, and you had sense enough that you could tell him he was naked, he'd try to do something about it. But when he shakes his head and says, I want to have it. Who are you to tell me what to do? I know where I'm standing. Now, if that ain't a pitiful shape, I don't know. And that's exactly what the God of this Bible said that the church would be in in this evil age right now in the last church age where we're living. Notice, but to the peoples, as many as I love, I rebuke. Now, if you're rebuked to the Lord of what you're doing, come out of it then. Get away Amen. from it. As many as I love, I rebuke. Now, seeing God. Now, what if those Pharisees would have said, wait a minute. That man's give us quite a challenge. He said, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They testify me. It's better that I look back in the Scriptures and find out what he's supposed to do. Who he is. What's supposed to take place? I should look back and find out. Instead of that, they went to the priest and asked him, what about it? See the difference? They should have been reading the Word. In Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible said, God in sundry times, that's old times, and in divers manners, wrote the Bible by the prophets. Now notice, he wrote the Bible by his own chosen way. See? Now, he didn't have to write it that way. Neither did he have to save man by blood. He didn't have to preach the gospel by man. He could let the sun or the moon or the stars preach the gospel. He could let the winds hum the gospel. But he chose man. And he chose the way his word came, and that was by his prophets, which were predestinated and foreordained, being a part of God's word, declaring the revelation of his word to that age and that time. For the word of God came to the prophets only. Never does it come to a theologian. Show me the scripture. It comes only to prophets. God cannot lie. So God wrote the Bible by His chosen method and His own chosen prophets. Not the prophets man had chose, but the prophets God had chose. Then His believers watched for the fulfillment of what their prophets said, and that's identification that they are God's prophets. Because first, they're inspired... Next, they say exactly with the word of the hour. Then that's his credentials. See, we went through that last Sunday. Many false prophets will rise. And we give the illustrations. How that Balaam and Moses, both of them anointed with the same spirit. One of them said, we're all one. Let's come join, put our girls and all together. We got pretty girls over here. You boys come over here and take your nice wife. It's all right. We're all one people in the hour, the same race. God never did forgive them for it. They listen to that. See, the world and the, the people are watching for some little outlet, some little bypass, some little shortcut. But there is no shortcuts in the Word of God. There's one pattern. You must cut yourself to fit that pattern, not try to cut the pattern to fit you. Everybody must do that. That's the only way God has to do it. Notice. Now, the believers wait for that word to be confirmed. See, it was not wrote by man, but by the Lord God. Therefore, it's not a book of man. Somebody said, it's just some old Hebrew writings. Would the Hebrews write a letter that condemned themselves? Would that fine nation of Jews, self-styled and polished, would they write their own iniquities, condemning them own selves? Certainly not. Tell of his own sins? How they went into idolatry, how they committed fornications against God's Word? No, no. They never tell that, that proud nation. It's not a book of man, it's a book of God. And the man who sees the visions or hears the voice of God never understood it many times. 
themselves in many cases. See, man didn't write the Bible. God wrote the Bible. It is not... It's not a man's book. It's God's book. It is God's thoughts expressed through human lips. That's what makes it the Bible. A thought expressed is a word. And in the beginning, it was God's thinking. He expressed it through the lips of His prophets and confirmed it by His servants. Notice, God does His own choosing by predestination. Chose the prophets for every age. Notice it. He fixes the nature of that prophet to fit that age. See? He fits his style, whatever he does. He fits him whether he's educated or not educated. He fits the gifts, the manner that he'll preach in. The gifts he'll have. And the message. For that certain age, God's predestinated that certain thing to happen, and there's not another thing can take its place. Amen. Care what Amen. it is, how many man-made achievements, nothing can take its place. He predestinated the man, maybe an ignorant man. He might have predestinated him another kind of a man. Whatever he is, he gives him his class, his, his gift, give him his nature, his style, and whatever it is, how he expresses himself and whatever he does, he makes the man of the hour to catch the people of the hour. Right? He does it. At the end of each age, when the church has turned to the world in sin and leaning upon the man's interpretation of the word, as ever they always at the end of the age have got in such a mess by their theologians and priests until it's always a mess up. Always their interpretation is wrong. Not one time has it ever failed to be wrong. And not one time has God's Word ever failed to be right. That's the difference. I see God wrote the Bible Himself. Now God can speak. Moses said he spoke to him. Jeremiah said he put words in my mouth. And God can write. He wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. He wrote on the walls of Babylon. And remember, of the Old Testament alone, 2,000 times the prophet said, Thus saith the Lord. God can speak. God can write. Certainly. Almost 90% of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the very words of God Himself. Jesus Christ speaking. So if God can write, if God can read, if God can talk, can He cause others to do the same? Did not He say to Moses, Who makes man dumb or who gives him speech? God wrote the Bible by the prophets. His way of doing it. Now, every time that the church gets mixed up, and God foreknew they would, for He foreknew all things. Therefore, He has a certain prophet ready for that age to call His electing by His vindicated word of signs and wonders and uh, confirmation of His word. Confirming the word with signs following, as He promised. He gives a true interpretation after the prophet himself has been vindicated. All but those... The elected to whom he is sent, hating. Now, examine every instant and see if that's right or not. Only the ones that he sent to, he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God. Notice, no Every examination of the Word and every instant at the end of every age or climax or junction, as I've preached on it many times, look at the age of Noah at the climax before judgment. What happened? Noah, it was only his own family that believed the man. The rest of them criticized him and destroyed the whole world. In the days of Abraham, only Abraham's group that believed when the angels went and preached to Sodom, only Lot and his wife and two daughters come out, and she turned back to a pillar of salt. In the days of Moses, only the elected of Israel come out, and Pharaoh hated him. In the days of Elijah, everything, almost but 7,000 men, 
Every one of them hated him, the whole nation. In the days of Jeremiah, while well, they threw it on right fruit at him and uh, called him a fanatic because he laid on his side for so many days and the other side and, and taken things and made symbols, they hated him. Isaiah the prophet, he condemned that race so much till they sawed him in two with a saw. Right. John the Baptist, he was a wild man. Down there some screaming maniac. All but, but those disciples that he presented to Jesus Christ as a church. There it is. John made ready a people. How many did he have? You could count them on both fingers. Both hands. Your fingers. How many that John presented to Jesus when he come? Now what about his second come? Think of it. But when the true Bible believers see the Word so openly vindicated for the age they believe, there's no way to keep them from it, believe it. They even seal their uh, testimony with their blood. They believe it. It's them. It's to them, the predestinated, that uh, for that certain age that sees and believes. Others just can't see it. They're blinded. Now you say they can't sit. Now, like Balaam, why couldn't Balaam see that? He was a prophet anointed. Why couldn't Pharaoh see it? When he seen the hand of God come down and perform miracles, there, it only hardened his heart. Is that right? Why couldn't Dathan see it? A Jew himself. Right out there and come through the Dead Sea and eat the manna every night that fell fresh and still couldn't see it. Why didn't Korah see it? Why didn't Caiaphas see it? He was a head religious man of the world at that time. Why didn't he see that was the Messiah? Why didn't Judas see it? Judas is right with them, walking with them, performing miracles with them. But the word had to be fulfilled. The Bible says they were raised up to take that place. They were raised for that purpose. That's true. Romans 8 says that. Now, the believers can see the Word is made flesh in their generation. God speaking. Now, them real true believers, them 7,000, or was it 700 in the days of Elijah? 7,000, right. In the days of Elijah, there was 7,000 men out of about 2 or 3 million that saw that that was right. Not even a hundredth of the people, hardly. But they saw it was right. They saw God manifested. That old widow that Elisha was sent to, she went to get those sticks to make a cake, and just enough to make a cake for her and her son, and then die. But watch Elijah. He said, Make me one first. For thus saith the Lord. The barrel will not fail and neither will the crucial run dry until the day the Lord God sends rain upon the earth. No question. Amen. She took right off to make the cake and give it to him. Hallelujah. Said, make mine first and then go make one for you and your son. Amen. For she heard that man and looked at him. She was a predestinated seed. Amen. Many of them say, there's that old crank again. God's cursed us because of him. Remember, Elijah said, you're the one that's troubling Israel. He said, you're the one that's troubled Israel. Oh, See who God, whose word he was vindicating? His own word. Amen. Now, the Bible says they was raised up for this purpose. But when the, the unbeliever, but now when the true believer can see the word of that age made flesh, God speaking to human lips, and then doing exactly what he said he would do. That settles it. Now watch the rest of it. Don't watch signs. If you watch signs, you'll be fooled as sure as the world. False prophets will rise and show signs and wonders that will deceive the elected if it was possible. Watch the Word. Look at these priests, these prophets, Hebrew prophets, standing there, uh, Zedekiah, with two great big horns and saying, I am a ordained of God prophet. 
true. I have 399 right here with me. And the Holy Spirit upon us, confirming and saying that land belongs to us. Let's go up and take it. And by these horns, Ahab, you have pushed the enemy off of our ground. For God gave us the ground. What's that religious man, good man? Jehoshaphat said, uh, haven't you got one more? <laughs> one more. There's 400 in agreement. He said, yes, I, there's one more around here, but I hate him. He said, he's always bawling all of us out and telling us what great sinners we are. And everything. He said, I hate him. He, he's Micah, the son of Imlan. He said, oh, don't let the king say so. Go get him. Let's say what he said. So they brought him down there. He said, give me tonight. And I'll see what the Lord says about it. Ahab said, I adjure you. But you tell me nothing but the truth. And the man comes and said, now, if you want to get back in good fellowship, say just like the rest of them. Micah said, I'll say just what God says. Amen. The next morning, they come out. The king's put their robes on, set in the gate. All the celebrity and the prophets stand there and say, now, fanatic, what you say about it? He said, go on up. He said, but I've seen Israel scattered like sheep having no shepherd. He sm- tucked his hand and smacked him in the mouth. The prophet smacked the prophet in the mouth. Now, both those anointed prophets standing there prophesying 400 against one. That looked pretty strong. Now, in the multitude of counsel, it's not always safety. It depends on where they're, what they're counseling about. What their counsel is. There wasn't safety there for the king. And he took that multitude... Uh, for their counseling to be right. But if you just stopped and turned back the scroll and look what Elijah just said, <laughs> then Micah couldn't say anything. He didn't know, but maybe God forgave him for it. But first, being a prophet, he went to God to find out what God said. And he found out what God said. He said, I saw God sitting up on a throne. And he said, had all of his counselors of heaven gathered around him and said, Who can we get to go down and cause Ahab to come out here so we can otherwise fulfill the prophecy that's made about him? See, prophecy. Elijah had already said, The dogs will lick your blood. And so he said, He's seen a lion spirit go up. From Boone, he'd come up, come up before him and said, I'll go down and get in his prophets, Ahab's prophets, and cause them to prophesy a lie. Now, God knew that that man was so puffed up and so full of theology that they thought they had everything right. They'd never noticed the word for the hour. So God said, you will succeed. Go on down. And when Micah said that, that made them prophesying under an evil spirit. They'd have jerked the plug out of the telephone or turned off the radio or done anything. They heard that coming against them. Got up and walked out. But... Look what happened. Now, Micah had to check his vision with the written word. Therefore, he knew. He said, when I come, put that man in prison. Give him waters of sorrow and bread of sorrow. When I return, I'll deal with him. He said, if you come back at all, God never spoke to me. Amen. That's when he knows his vision is exactly with every word for that hour. It was Ahab's time. Brother, sister, this is the hour and the time of the calling out of Babylon. The evening lights are here. Walk in the light while it is light. Notice, the believer saw the word manifested and believe it. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, my word. My signs of the age, a false one they'll not follow. Now let's get to our text because I see him go to get away and I want to emphasize on that prayer line a lot. Let's get back to the text now we got under consideration here for a minute. Well, it had happened again like it always did. As usual, God sent His prophet John, as His word had said, promised, in Malachi 3, Behold, I send my messenger before my face to prepare the way. John witnessed the same thing. And we find out also in Isaiah 40 and 3 that Isaiah said, 
There will be a voice of a prophet, one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. See? All those prophecies and, and look, notice quickly the Scripture identified him. When they said, Who are you? Are you the Messiah? He said, I am not. Are you Jeremiah the prophet or one of them? He said, I am not. But I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, as saith the prophet Isaiah. You think they'd believe that? No, sir. Why? He didn't come through their church. He wasn't of their class. See, he went in the wilderness at the age of nine years old and come out at 30. His message was too great to go through a school of theology. He was the one to introduce the, the Messiah. And everybody would be pulled him this way and that way. And God sent him in the wilderness after the death of his father, Zechariah. And he was a priest, but he never followed the line of his father because prophets don't come out of such things as that. They come from the rugged lands, the wilderness. No man knows where they come from or how they rise on the scene or any of their history. They just come right out and preach the word and God takes them off and away they go. Condemns that generation and moves on into his word. Waiting for the great day. The church did not believe him. Because he was not known to them. They had no record of his ordination on their books. So therefore, they refused him. See, they didn't believe God's vindicated word. Plainly, letter by letter. See? Malachi 3. Two scriptures to vindicate him. Malachi 3 and Isaiah 40 and 3. See? Both those scriptures spoke of a man coming preparing the way of the Lord. He met every specification of it. He used to be a prophet. I'll send to you Elisha. There he was in every rugged way. Watch how his nature blended in with Elijah. Elijah was a man of the wilderness. So was John. The outdoors. He wasn't a smooth man. He was a rugged man. Notice again. Elijah was a woman hater. He told Jezebel about all of her paint and where to get on and off at. So was John. Jezebel tried to kill Elijah. Swore by her gods that she'd take his head off of him. So did Herodia. Okay? Always. Watch their message. Watch what they did. Now, we find out that they would have looked back and seen what the Bible said and what's the nature of the man and how perfect he was in time with the Scriptures and everything. They ought to know that was him. About a half a dozen knew it. That's right. Not over a half a dozen realized it. They went to hear him, but they didn't believe it. See why? They did not believe the identification of prophecy in their hour. Notice they laughed at him, calling him some screaming, wild, unlearned fanatic with no schooling, get hate, tote, carry, fetch, so forth. As usual, they judged him by his education. They judged him by his grammar, by the way he dressed. He had a piece of sheepskin around him and a camel skin belt on. He was all hairy, walking out in the waters, no church, no pew, no cooperation. They couldn't accept that. They was worshiping the God of the world. I don't mean to say now there's not false prophets that comes out, like Jambus and Jambus, but the way you want to do it is check the original message by the Word. Then you got it. What age it's in and what's prophesied for that age. Then John's prophecy was vindicated in God's own order. Watch how perfect. The Bible said the Word of the Lord comes to the prophet. And Jesus was the Word. And John was prophesying of the coming of the Word for fulfillment. And Jesus, the Word, came to the prophet in the water. <laughs> oh, how beautiful. How unfailing is the... See, the Word was the scariest thing in that day. Here come the prophet saying, I am the voice of the Word. He said, what must we do? He said, I'm not worthy to unloose his shoes. But there's one standing among you somewhere. He'll be the one that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. His hands in his hand and he'll thoroughly purge his floor and burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Take the grain to the corner. Oh, what a prophet. Jesus said there's never a man born of a woman as great as he to that day. 
Oh, how blusterous, how he knowed where he was standing. He knowed exactly, he had heard from God and it was exactly with the word. So he didn't care what people said. He preached it and prophesied it and out. Watch, when a man stands for what is truth, then God's obligated to vindicate that man the truth. When Moses come down there in Egypt and said, I was in the wilderness yonder, and I seen a tree on fire, and it didn't consume. I went up to the tree, and when I did, there's a great pillar of fire hanging in there. And a boy said, I am that I am. And he told me to take this stick and come down here and perform these miracles, and God will vindicate his word. Stretched out his stick, there come fleas and flies and darkness and so forth. And then, to vindicate that prophet, he brought those believers right back to the mount, and God came down in the same pillar of fire. Right on the same mountain and proved that that was right. Now look what he's done in this day. Exactly. Now, the word come to the prophet and vindicated him to be the true person, the very person that the scripture said that he would be. Quickly now. But again, Jesus came in a different form from their man-made interpretation of the prophecy. Man had interpreted what it would be. Certainly, the Presbyterians think that a, it ought to be them. Watch when God does anything, watch every other organization rise up with one. Yeah. Always been that way. They got a jambers and jambies everywhere. Notice, they said part of the word, but according to the prophet's word, every letter. They missed it again as usual. Called him a fortune teller, a devil. Beelzebub, and said he made himself God. When they ought to know by the very Bible that he was God. Notice, he was prophesied by Isaiah. Isaiah 9 and 6 said his name shall be called the Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. There ain't going to be no more fathers after that. Because he was the first father in the beginning, he's the only father. So don't you call any man of this earth father either after that. He's the, the mighty God and the everlasting Father. The counselor, the prince of peace. Certainly. Now they had done to him what all the prophets listed that they would do. Just as they are doing in this very Laodicean age. Putting out of the church blind, naked, and don't know it. Just what the prophet said. The prophet of the Bible. Blinded by man's traditions, they put him out, the word, out of their churches. As usual, as prophesied of them, notice, now, quickly now, don't miss this now. Here's the text. How Jesus made himself known to these two disciples that he was their Messiah. Now, all eyes this way. And out in the land, don't miss this now. We tried to tell you that the Bible is the Word of God wrote by God Himself through the lips and hospitality of man. God can write Himself. God can speak Himself. God can do what He wants to. But He chose man to do it because the man that wrote it is part of God. So God wrote the Bible. The man didn't even know what they were writing in their own human thinking. They might disagree with it, but they wrote it. They couldn't. The Bible said, man of old as they was moved by the Holy Ghost. God moved their hands, moved their eyes into visions. They could say nothing of what they were looking at. They could speak nothing because he had full control of tongue, finger, ever organ of the body was in full sway with God. No wonder the Bible said they were God's. They were a part of God. He was the fullness of God. Notice how Jesus, the Word, made these two heartbroken disciples know He was their Messiah. The Messiah, the promised Word. Notice what He done. He appealed to prophecy. Notice, fools... Slow to believe all that the prophets wrote. Now, he never said, 
Oh, what, what did the church say about it? They had given the story. They knowed all the events that happened. They was all sad. They began to tell him, are you just a stranger here? Or you don't know what's happened in Jerusalem? He said, what things? Like he didn't know. See, he does things sometimes to see what you'll do about it. He said, what things? Who was it? What's happened? Are you just a stranger? And it's talking right to the man that lived with for three and a half years and didn't know him. What things? What happened? Well, they said, Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, no doubt in our mind, he was mighty in word and deed before all the people. We've seen him do things that he was identified the prophet of God for this age. We know that. And we believe that he would be the redeemer, that he would redeem Israel. Then he turns and said, you fools, slow of heart to believe that all that the prophets said about him wouldn't come to pass. Watch him. Now, go back to prophecy. What a rebuke for believers. Claim they believe him. Notice how he approached the subject. He never come right out and said, I am your Messiah. He could have done it, for he was. But notice... He identified himself in the Word. Amen. Then they would know. If he had said it, he could have said that, and it wouldn't have been so. But when he went and began to speak on all the prophets said about him, and they seen it, then they could tell themselves if they were God's children. But call their attention to what the prophets had foretold and said to look for in the time that the Messiah, his age, would be manifested. He, as John, let the Word, the Bible, identify their message. Any true prophet would do it. No. He didn't come out and say, I am he. I'm... That's not a true prophet. Of God. See? But he said, go back in the Scriptures. See, he never fails his way of doing it. See? He said, uh... We know Moses. He said, if you were to know Moses, you'd know me. He said, Moses wrote on me. He said, search the Scripture. In them you think you have eternal life, and the Scripture is what testifies of me. Go and look in the Scripture and see it. Here he never changes his way of doing it. Never has changed. He never can change because he's an unchanging God. See? Notice. He went right back to these two disciples, Cleopas and his friend on the road to Emmaus, and said, appeal to the Scriptures to him. said, why are you so foolish to not to believe that every word the prophets wrote concerning Messiah would have to be fulfilled? Oh, what a day. John did the same thing. Search the Scriptures. Look back. said, there be a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Where did it come from? That's. That should have made it plain to them. Right? That should make it plain today. The thing that we see the Holy Spirit doing. He once said, search the Scriptures. And we, He wants us to do it today. Notice, He began with Moses' prophecy, the Bible says. He beginning with Moses and all of the prophets. But He started with Moses. A prophet said, Moses, the Lord your God shall raise up among you people, among the people, the Lord God shall raise up a prophet. Now, he might have said, Cleopius, and your friend here, did not Moses say that in these days the Lord God would raise up a prophet? And this man that they crucified, did he meet that qualification? Now, Moses prophesied this, and now you haven't had a prophet for hundreds and hundreds of years. And here this man raised up. And what was this man's forerunner, did you say? Get it? And all the prophets said about him for his age. He spoke to him. It sure would have been interested to listen at him. Wouldn't you like to hear him? I'd like to hear him. To hear him what he said that the prophet said about himself. But he never said it was him. He just showed him a prophecy. He just said the prophet said this had happened. See? Let's just go back a few minutes 
And now let's listen to the words quoted by himself. Watch here. The word itself quoting the word of himself. <laughs> the word itself quoting the word <laughs> of himself. Not telling him that he was that, but just let the word speak for itself. Then they know who he was. The letter of the word quoting the word in uh, the word in flesh quoting the word of the letter being fully identified with himself. Look here. Now let's listen to him quote. How now we know that they were all brief to the late happenings, that is, of the crucifixion and of the story of the resurrection of the tomb, as we just read. Now he goes straight to the word of prophecy about himself. Now let's just think that he said this. He said a lot more than this. But what? Let's say him, hear him say, turn over to Zechariah 11 and 12. And wasn't the Messiah to be so according to the prophet for 30 pieces of silver? You just said that this man was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Turn over, you get them scriptures? Zechariah 11 and 12. And then he said, did you notice what David said in the Psalms? Psalm 41, 9. He was be betrayed by his friends. And then again in Zechariah 13, 7, he was forsaken by his disciples. And in Psalms 35, 11, accused by false witnesses. You just said he was. Isaiah 53, 7, he was dumb before his accusers. Isaiah 56, they scourged him, the prophet said. Psalms 22, he was to cry on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did he do that day before yesterday afternoon? Psalms 22 again, 18, his garments was parted among them. Did they do that? And Psalms 22, 78, mocked by his enemies. The church. Psalms 22 again, there was not a bone in his body to be broke, but they pierced my hands and my feet, he said. Holding his hands behind him, no doubt, at the time. Isaiah 53, 12 said he would die between malefactors. Isaiah 53, 9 said he was buried with the rich. Psalm 16, 10 said... I will not leave his soul in hell, neither will I suffer my Holy One to see corruption. And was not Malachi 3 the forerunner of this man? Oh, I'd like to hear him quote that. Look at the prophecies. Notice, then all the types he might have went through about Isaac in Genesis 22, how God foreshadowed Isaac how Father Abraham took his own son, packing the wood up the hill, and offered up his own son. It was now beginning to soak into him. He done told them they were fools for not looking at the prophecy for that day. And now begin to soak in, begin to see the fulfilling of all this that had taken place in the last few days, in the last two or three years. The vindicated prophecy of the age. It was then that they knew that their crucified friend Jesus had fulfilled every word of this. Oh, it was then that they know that that man truly was that Messiah. That that he should raise from the dead. The grave couldn't hold him. I will not suffer my Holy One to see corruption. There's not one word of prophecy can ever fail. And he did raise. Then that messenger's down at the tomb this morning was right. He is risen from the dead. He is alive. He is that Messiah. Why? Don't fail it. His action, his ministry, and everything he's done has been vindicated exactly the words that the prophet said would take place for this day. That's done it. Then they know that it was him, their crucified friend Jesus, that had done it. No wonder their hearts burned within them as he talked to them. Now, 
They'd walk six miles. And it seemed like a short time. And here's another thing they'd done. You know, they'd heard a six-hour sermon on prophecy being vindicated. That's what he talked to them along the road. Just as soon as they started down the road, he stepped out. Or he's right there at Jerusalem. Six hours later, later, 64 long, they was right down the road six miles to Emmaus. That's what it is. And he had preached confirmed prophecy for six hours. Don't condemn me on my three then. <laughs> but notice, they had preached, they had heard a six-hour sermon on prophecy being confirmed, vindicated. Now it was getting along towards evening time. You know, he's the same yesterday day and forever. It was then that he opened their eyes to know if Hebrews thirteen eight he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. At the evening time, events are made clear by the prophecy. What's taking place in a modern hour can be easily identified if you'll just believe the prophecy of the hour. Yes, fools, slow of understanding, slow to believe. You keep pondering over it. To believe that all the prophets said about the Messiah, wouldn't it have to happen? Now he checked these points all back and showed what the prophets said that would happen. Then they begin to understand. So he said, uh, act like he's going to go on by. They like this man. They said, you, you give us something. We never thought that. He is alive somewhere. Is talking to him. Didn't know it. So, he, uh, no doubt, he looked at him, sadly, and he started to walk on by. But he is waiting for them to invite him. That's what he's waiting tonight. For you to invite him. And notice, when those disciples invited him in to their fellowship around the table, it was then that he'd done something just like he did before his crucifixion. And their eyes come open. They know his manner, his style. They know what he'd done. And he did it then just like he did before. And they said, that's him! Amen. And quickly, they raised up to scream it out. He vanished. And more than it took six hours to listen to this sermon, maybe 20 minutes, they were light-footed back to tell the rest of them, He's risen indeed. He is really alive. Friends, this is the fulfillment of Malachi 4, St. Luke 17, St. John 15. Oh, so many Revelations 10. So many prophecies that can be penned exactly to this day. And also in the book of Mark and in Matthew where he said these great signs and wonders would appear in the sky and people call them saucers, flying saucers. Can, can vanish with the power and quickness of a thought. Intelligence that can move in. He can write. He can speak. He can do whatever he wants to. The great pillar of fire, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And sights coming up on the earth. Pyramids of smoke rising into the air way above where there cannot be no humidity or nothing. Thirty miles high. Amen. Predicted a year and a half before it happened <laughs> that it would be that way. Then turn the picture and see who it is looking down. Not one word has ever failed that's been told. And here's God's written word confirming it's the truth. And it's evening time again. I wonder if he would return by grace tonight and do something now like he done back there. Let's pray and ask him. Events made clear by vindicated prophecy. God Almighty... Help us. Help us, dear God, to understand. To understand the things that we should know. 
understand thy word. And now, Lord, we have heard sermons now for nearly 2,000 years, writings of books, and in this last day, here it slipped right back again. And now it's towards evening time. The Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, and many of them down through the ages talk with you and maybe just along the way of this great day that hasn't been either night or day, as the prophet said, but in the evening time it'll be like. Jesus rose from the tomb and appeared to Simon, to the women, and showed them that he was alive. That was the morning. And then in the evening he'd come back again. But he did walk to them through the day, rebuking them for their blindness. But then he made himself known to them in the evening time. God come into our fellowship tonight that we have around the Word. God is so scarcely believed today amongst the peoples, but I'm thankful that there is some that you have called and ordained them to eternal life, and you said, all that the Father has given me will come. Now while the evening lights are shining, while you have permitted, Lord, that not one prophecy out of the hundreds that went forth has ever failed one time, then truly... If that identifies, it has to be you because no person could be that accurate. Just like the Bible. No man could write. No one in the space of 1,600 years by full 40 different writers could write and not one error be in it. Dear God, I pray that you will manifest yourself tonight of Hebrews 13, 8, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the works that you did then, you do today. And you promised it. You said in this last days, when the world is setting like Sodom and Gomorrah, perversion, we look at these boys just so much like girls wearing clothes like them and, and see the girls trying to act like boys and see the women and men in this perverted age, see sex appeal has become an a idol of worship. The gospel has been pushed out to one side and Nakedness in the Lady of Sea Church. Oh God, what an hour. Come, Lord Jesus, make yourself known to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Now, while you have your heads bound, your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you something. You believe that God is here? You believe that the things it's doing today is prophecy fulfilled? You believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? You believe when He was here manifest in the flesh for that day and the works that He'd done there was to be repeated again in this day? The prophets said so. The Bible said so. All Scripture must be fulfilled. It cannot fail. How did He identify Himself? By being that prophet that Moses spoke of. Know the secrets of the hearts of the people. The woman touched his garment. He turned and said, Thy faith has saved thee. When Simon Peter come up to him, he knowed his name, told him who he was, who his father was. That same lovely Jesus is not dead. He's alive forevermore. Praise be to God. And I believe in this evening time now, he's called us together again. Oh, Lord Jesus, come among us. Don't pass us by. Come stay all night with us till this night is over. Then let us go with you tomorrow. We might know you in the power of your resurrection. That your love and grace and mercy might be with us. Oh, eternal God, grant these things. We know that only God alone can grant them. the solemnness of this hour, let us say this, God our Father, our flesh is a poor tabernacle for you, but Lord, let your sanctifying grace, your Holy Spirit, come now. Cleanse us from every doubt and every flusteration, every suspicion, and every line of skepticism that would be in us, that we might be free 
without one doubt, come out, confess boldly like Peter, Thou art the Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. We believe that Thy Word is truth, Lord. Let us just see before we start this prayer line, Lord, and make Yourself known to us. As You said, as it was in the days of Lot, when Abraham, that called out group, waiting for a promised son, Lot was down there here in a modern Billy Graham and an old Roberts to that denominational setup down there as a nation. But Abraham was a sojourner without any organization, just this little group wandering about through the land that he was to heir, and the meek shall inherit the earth. One day, under the shade tree, while they were setting resting, God came down in the form of a man. Two angels went down into Sodom. And God, in human flesh, proved that He was. He said, Abraham, where is thy wife Sarah? A few days before that, he was Abram. And S-A-R-R-A, Sarah. Not Sarah, princess. And you called her by her prince's name, the daughter of a king. You told Abraham by... His name, Abraham, a father of nations. And you said, I am going to visit you. God, how that prophet's heart must have jumped. He knew who you was right then. No wonder he washed your feet, brought out all the food that he had in the very best, laid it before you. He knew that was God there. Then he said, where is Sarah? As if he didn't know. And you, Abraham said to him, He's in the tent, she's in the tent behind you. And you said what was going to happen, and she in her heart doubted it. And then you, you said to Abraham, Why did Sarah doubt that? Saying in her heart these things can't be. Is anything too hard for God? Oh, God. Jesus manifested God of the Word. You said, as it was in the days of Sodom, the world would be in that condition just before the destruction of the Gentile world, the Gentile dispensation. Here we are, Sodomites to the core. And then you said that the Son of Man, which is always referred to as a prophet, would be revealed in that hour. Fulfill thy words, O God. We, your believing children, wait with sincere hearts, to give us faith, Lord, that when we have the prayer line, the people will believe. It's evening time, Father. Let the evening lights of the Son of God, He that was and which is and shall come, manifest Himself by the prophecy that He's made. In Jesus Christ's name, Amen. I am now ready to, to pray for the sick. But it's a strange thing how that when we stand here, here I stand here now making a challenge to the public and hooked up across the nation. That God still is God. He cannot fail. And what He promises, that He'll do. He'll never fail to do it, for He promised to do it. Therefore, I can place solemn confidence in what He said. Therefore, I look for His coming. I look for Him to appear at any time, because He said in an hour that you'd think not, the world thinks not, then He'll appear. Now, so far as I know, I'm in my tabernacle here. And there's a few people sitting here that I, I do know. Brother Wright, a few of these sitting here, that right along here, I do know. But there's many of you I do not know. And I have no way of saying that God will do this. Tonight, we have seen Him do it for the past years and years. But he might not do it tonight. I don't know. That's up to him. He's sovereign. He does what he wishes to. No one can tell him what to do. He abides alone. 
and His will and His ways. But because that He promised it, I'm asking Him to do it. Not for our sake that we need it, but maybe for some stranger's sake, that the Holy Spirit might be anointed, anointing upon us. Now, no matter how much He anoints me, He's got to anoint you too. Certainly. To believe. Now, I want to have a prayer line and I want to pray for the sick as much as I can. Now, we can either have a line to call the people and bring them up here, a prayer line, and pray for everybody here that's sick, I suppose. Have my minister brothers to come here with us and lay hands up on you. We can sure do that. Or either we can ask our Father, who is the only one that could do anything for you? Because my hands is just a man like you man. But the thing of it is, it isn't the human hand that does it. It's the Word of God. Faith in that Word is what does it. No scientific thing about it. It's altogether unscientific. There's not one thing the Christian has in his armor that's scientific. Do you know that? Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness, patience, faith, Holy Ghost. Everything is unseen by science. And that's the only thing that's real and lasting. Everything you look at comes from the earth and goes back to the earth. But the things that you can't see with your eye, but see it declare itself, that's the world of eternal. Would you believe if God would manifest Himself and show that He is here alive, doing the same things that He did at the beginning after this message, would you accept it as your healing? May God grant it. Now I'm asking anybody in the house, no matter who you are or where you're from, I'm asking you just to solemnly believe this message to be the truth. That is the message that God has in His Bible for this hour. That Jesus Christ is sure tonight and is alive. Now, nearly all you people know of me. I'm right here in a town where it's raised up. I don't even have a grammar school education. That's exactly true. And you've known me long enough. I hope I've lived before to show you that I'm honest and sincere. I'm not a hypocrite. Even my critics don't say that. They, they just say, you're, you're not a hypocrite, but you're just simply wrong. <laughs> you're just ignorantly wrong, not willfully. I don't think that I'm ignorantly wrong because the Word of God testifies of my message. Amen. It should tell you who it is. Yes. And you clearly hear me say it isn't me. So then it has to be Him. Is that right? Have faith in God then. Look this away. And you believe God. If you can believe God, God will grant to you. If He can do that like He did before, then He's still God. You believe that? you believe it? A lady sitting here before me looking at me, tears in her eyes, sincerely. I don't know who she is, never seen her. I'm a stranger to you. Do you think God knows the secret of your heart, your desires, or your sin, or whatever it is? you think He knows? you think He could reveal to me what your sin is? What you've done, what you ought not have done, or your desire, whatever it is. If he had do it, would it make you believe him, know that it has to be him? Would you accept it as him? It's not your sin that's bothering you. You've confessed that. But you're wanting the baptism of his Holy Spirit. You shall receive it. I've seen it move down across her. That you might know that I was looking at the woman. She's looking at me. I want to show you the Holy Spirit. Look here right over this little woman sitting here down beneath my feet here. 
When I said that, that's the same thing she wants, is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You believe that you will receive it, sister? Raise up your hand. I've never seen the woman in my life knowingly. See this man sitting here with his head down, sitting right there with his collar misfitting him and so forth. He's suffering with a bladder trouble. You believe that God will make you well? Raise up your hand if you'll accept it. All right? God grants you your request. This young man sitting right here wanting the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You believe God will give it to you, sir? With your white string tie hanging back? God will grant it? This man here is praying for his wife. She's in an institution. You believe that God will heal her and make her well? You believe it? You can have it. With your hand up to your throat? You believe that God can heal that heart condition that's bothering you? The stomach trouble that you have? You're sitting there suffering right now. Is that right? You believe He heals you? And you can have it. Amen. You see, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ask those people. See if I know them. I don't, but He does. Amen. See that light on the side of the wall, Yonder? Hanging right down over a man sitting there. He's suffering with a spinal condition in his back. He's not from here. He's from Georgia. <laughs> Mr. Duncan, believe with all your heart, God will heal that back trouble. You believe with all your heart? God bless you. <laughs> Here's a man sitting way back here with back trouble, looking at me. I don't know him, but it's Mr. Thompson, if you believe. Raise up, sir, back there. So I'm a stranger to you. That's right. But you're sitting there praying. Your back trouble's healed now. Jesus Christ makes you well. It shall be light just about the evening time. Don't you see? He's here tonight. He's a great I am. He's the same yesterday and forever. you believe it? Are you satisfied and convinced that this is Jesus Christ making Himself known, identifying Himself in prophecy? Don't worry about the eye. God heals the sick and the afflicted. How many people, are, how many of you are sick? Let's see your hands it just seems like it's such a pull and a strain. Have any of you people got prayer cards? I don't know how I'd get you through here. I want to pray for you, and I don't know how to do it. You see what? Look at the wall. How am I going to get them in there? Why, if you get one out of jam, you got the other blocked right there. Everybody stop still. Listen. Hear me. Have I ever told you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? Is that right? Everything has always been right. I've never asked you for one penny of money in my life, have I? Not one time. Never took an offering in my life. I'm not here for money. I'm not here to deceive you. I'm here to manifest God's Word of the hour. I've told you the truth, and God has testified that it is the truth. Now, I tell you, thus saith the Scriptures, that if the believer lays his hands up on the sick, Jesus said, they shall recover. Do you believe that? Then in the presence of God, don't you believe he'll do it right now? Now, put your hands on one another and just hold it there for a minute. Now, don't, don't pray. Just put your hands on one another. Out there in the land, and me, myself, I'm laying myself over these handkerchiefs. Now, I want you to look at me just a minute. What has God left undone? Look how He's... What the Word that we have read, the prophecies that we have told that Jesus identified Himself by the prophecies. Now, look at the hour. In these last three weeks, 
where we have placed the hour that we're living. Look at what we have read. How about the false prophets and almost signs that would deceive the elected? How the word has been manifested? How the God of this age has blinded the lie hearts of the people? And how the God himself has said through his prophecies that these things would take place in this Laodicea age. There's nothing left undone. God is here, just the same God that talked to those people on Emmaus that identified himself by the prophecies that was foretold of him. He's here tonight identifying his presence by the prophecies foretold for this age. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can you believe it? Then lay your hands upon one another. Don't pray for yourself, but in your own way, pray for that person that you got your hands on because they are praying for you. Now look, don't doubt. And I, if you could see what I'm looking at, and you know I wouldn't lie to you standing here. If you could see and your faith could draw that great holy spirit that sailed under the air that science has took pictures of and see it moving through this building, just trying to find a place to, to land, trying to find an anchor place. Only believe it, my brother. He's identified it by Scripture and so forth that it's right. Now pray with sincerity for that person you got your hands on. They're praying for you. Dear Jesus of Nazareth, why, we are conscious, Lord, by the word that you're here, by the promise that you're here. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And these signs will follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover out over the ways of this telephone. May the great Holy Spirit go into every congregation. May the same... Holy light that we look at right here in the church. May it fall upon each and every one, and may they be healed at this time. We rebuke the enemy, the devil, in the presence of Christ. We say to the enemy that he is defeated by the, the precarious suffering, the death of the Lord Jesus, and the triumph resurrection on the third day. And his proven evidence that he's here among us tonight, alive after 1,900 years. Let the Spirit of the living God fill every heart with faith and power and healing virtue from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is identified now by this great light circling the church in his presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, grant it. For the glory of God, may these handkerchiefs that we pray over, may they go to the sick and the afflicted that they're intended to. May the same Holy Spirit that's here now identifying Himself, identify Himself on every patient that these is laid upon. May the presence of God so fill their heart with faith until the sickness of their body will be healed. This we ask for the glory of God in the presence of Jesus Christ and in the name of Jesus Christ as we the servants of Jesus Christ ask it. Amen. Amen. Now, from your hearts, I don't care what was wrong with you, can you from your heart believe with all your heart that the Word of God has granted you your request? I believe that every hand, as I could see, went up. If you believe it, now remember, it is finished. Amen. You out there on the telephone wires, if you have believed with all your heart, as the ministers are laying hands upon you and the loved ones laying hands upon you, if you believe with all your heart that it's finished, it's finished. The great Holy Spirit is here in the tabernacle tonight. I seen him move over the people, showed himself over here on the side of a wall and went down upon a man, come down here and up to the building, making known the secrets of the hearts.
the identification of His presence to show that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is in our midst. He's God, the never-failing God. And did not our hearts burn within us? And does not it burn now to know that we are now in the presence of the resurrected Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and praise forevermore, who is in the express image of the Almighty Jehovah, who sailed down in a form of a pillar of fire and a burning bush to attract the attention of a prophet, who had descended upon the mountain, and anyone that even touched it was to be killed besides Moses and Joshua. How do, it was that he led the children of Israel through the wilderness in their journey as a type of the called out people today. Here he is by scientific research, even identified himself before science. And by his very actions and by his very prophecy, the things that's prophesied of him to do in this day, to make him the same yesterday, today, and forever has been perfectly vindicated. Isn't it enough to make our hearts burn within us? God bless you. Now, with one accord, let's stand and say, I now accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Healer. And by His grace, from this hour henceforth, O oh God, let no unbelief ever enter my heart. For I have seen the prophecy of this day fulfilled. I believe that Jesus Christ is alive. And here now, confirming His Word of this hour, the prophecies that was written of Him has now been fulfilled in our midst. He is my Savior, he is my, my God, my, God. my, king. my king, my all in all. My all, in all. Dear God, hear our testimony and give to us day by day the bread of life. And we offer Thee praise, O God, from the depths of our heart. We praise Thee, the Mighty One, the God of the prophets. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Oh, what a moment. What a time. Only believe. Only believe. Just only believe. Oh. May we sing it like this now I believe Oh now I believe All things are possible oh, now I believe Now That's your testimony? Amen. Now as we bow our heads, till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at
Vail is standing here to dismiss in prayer. Brother Lee Vail, he's a writer for the tabernacle here of the literature and books and so forth. Very precious brother. He's been with me many campaigns. Wish I had a chance to let every minister get him up here and talk to him. You understand, I'm sure, every minister. We're glad to have you here. All the laity, the people of different churches, what more? We're glad to have you here. And it's truly our prayer to one another. God be with you till we meet again. With our heads bowed and our hands raised, let's sing it again real sweetly to God. Till we meet.